Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Mark chapter number 5. The Gospel of Mark chapter number 5. As you're turning there tonight, I'll be preaching that we all have light to shine. We all do. We all have a testimony. We want to make sure it's a good one, but we all have a testimony. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's neutral, whether it's active, whether it's dead, whatever it might be, but we all have a testimony. So I want to encourage you to be back this evening. We have a light to shine. Mark chapter number 5, this is, a, this is a fantastic chapter, I'll tell you why, because Jesus is, is moving from one hopeless situation to another. We live, we live in a world today that whether people want to acknowledge it or not, it, it really, there is so many hope, seemingly hopeless situations out there You'd think that you'd think that people would go, man. We need to have the Lord. We we need the Lord, and I'll tell you, only the Lord could straighten out any of this stuff. And here we have Jesus. He's moving from one hopeless situation to another hopeless situation. We have him. We have him dealing with the madman of Gadara. This this man who is possessed of the devil, but not just one. I mean, the devil says that their name, his name is Legion because there are many. We know there's at least 2,000 demons inside this one human being. They go and they, that Jesus uh, casts them out and they go into a herd of swine, and, uh, which, is where, which is probably a good place for demons to go, into a herd of swine. And, uh, but, but then this man is delivered. This man who has been just hopelessly possessed and nobody wants anything and everybody's scared of him. And, and he's cutting himself. By the way, one of the sure signs of demonic activity in a person's life is when they begin to start to mutilate their flesh. Uh, the devil doesn't like, doesn't, you know, he, he wants to destroy everybody. And so the, the, the creation of God is something that he is obviously trying to destroy all the time. And this, this, this man is, is a wild man, and nobody can tame him. And Jesus comes along and delivers this man. And then, and then leaves him there. He wants to go with Jesus, but leaves him there and says, go in to your friends, go into your family there in the town and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Can I share with you just in, in brief that the greatest witness that you'll ever have to your lost family and friends is, is not necessarily to try to get them under the weight of, of some kind of guilt but initially, they need to realize they're sinners and need Christ, yes. But I think primarily where we fail is sometimes we fail to tell people the great things that the Lord has done for us. And that's what Jesus told this, this formerly demon-possessed man. And then, and then, you know, he moves on and he deals with a very sick woman, as we're going to read. And, uh, and I'll tell you, there's all kinds of folks that are suffering all kinds of physical needs. This woman had a tremendous physical need that she could not get any relief from for 12 long years. And she was desperate. Not only that, I think uh, she was broke. She had spent everything she had on physicians and all this. Not putting down physicians, but... Man is limited, and the Lord is unlimited. But of all the hopeless situations, whether demon possession or this woman who is very sick, I, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning on, I think, what is the most hopeless realities that there is in 
humankind, and that is the reality of death. You, you see, death is the single greatest hopeless and most desperate time for most people. Uh, you know, you can have folks, um, we've, we've, we've got a lot of military people who have seen death. They've, they've experienced, uh, you know, people dying in front of them. They've, they've, they've gone through these horrendous things, no question about it. And, um, and you, can become, you can become somewhat insulated to the fact of death and get to the place where you have accepted it and realized that, you know, this is something that could happen. And people that, that are in law enforcement and military, they deal with this on a daily basis. But you know, for the average person, and maybe even for them as well, when death finally comes knocking on the door, when death is imminent, it can be a, a very desperate time. It can be a very hopeless time. For the born again child of God, it's, it's not that way. I've, I've been at several deathbeds. I've led people to Christ. Uh, Natalie's husband, I prayed with him and he accepted Christ as Savior an hour before he went into eternity. Boy, he's happy for that prayer, Natalie. And you know something? It's, it's, it's one of those things where prior to coming to Christ, death has such a terrifying grip. We don't like thinking about it. We don't talk about it. It's morbid, we say. It's all these kind of things. But it's also a reality. It's also a reality. And, and we have a father that we're going to look at. He's got a little girl. You know, it's one thing to say, well, you know, I mean, our, 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 our good brother in Christ, Rick Zetterman, uh, he, he texted me uh, yesterday, last evening, uh, the, cancer, the cancer in his brain is slowly, uh, inch by inch, taking him. Um, and now he has no ability to move his legs. He has, um, it, it, it took his left hear, ear, hearing out of his left. It's taken now his hearing out of his right. Cannot hear anything at all. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm hoping that they're watching the service on live stream, but only, be, only if they could figure out how on uh, their iPad or whatever to put in closed captioning. I'm saying this to you because here's a man who knows Christ. Here's a man who on repeated occasions said, Pastor, I know where I'm going, and I'm ready for the Lord to take me. But that's not always the case. And even when it's us, sometimes that is not as, as terrifying as when it's someone that we love. And so here's a father, he's got a little girl. And this little girl's dying. And, um, and Jesus gives him five words that are found in verse 36. Be not afraid, only believe. It's not some trite statement, obviously, it's the word of the Lord. It, it seems like there should be something maybe a little bit more profound, doesn't it? There, there needs to be something a little bit more miraculous than just those five words. It seems like we all, if we're Christians, it seems like, well, yeah, of course we already know this. So how come it is that if we know this, it isn't evident in our life? In many cases. I want you to see, first of all, this man whose name is Jairus by name. And I want you to see his revealed faith. In Mark chapter 5, beginning verse 21, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. 
I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now that's revealed faith, beloved. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. So here Jesus is, he's showing up after this huge event uh, in Gadara. He's come across the sea to Capernaum now, and, and, and a throng of people are there. Are they there because they really want to hear Jesus and what Jesus has to say? Probably not. They're, they're there, they're thronging him for what they can get. They've heard about the miracles. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but I think, Christians, I, I think Christians use Christianity for what they can get, not for what they can give. And so this man, Jairus, he comes, he pushes through the crowd. He's humbling himself before Jesus. He's in great distress. Who wouldn't? Your little daughter's dying. Nobody can help. His revealed faith said, if you come to my daughter, she shall live. That's amazing. I want you to notice something about this man. In verse 22, it says he's a ruler of the synagogue. A ruler of the synagogue. He's not a priest, or it would have identified him as one. But what it means is that he has got a very high position within the synagogue. He is the one that sets everything in order and has everything ready in the synagogue for worship. He's got a big position. He's a very important man. And Jairus had power and privilege and, and, and popularity and paycheck and all of it. And not, not to mention the fact that he was probably a an extremely religious man. But his little girl's dying. His little girl's dying and his paycheck can't save her. His power can't save her. Popularity can't save her. I mean, his tremendous religious background can't save her. His little girl's dying. And he's left her side to go find Jesus. That's pretty tremendous faith that's being revealed here. He's like everybody else. Listen, the, the miracles of Jesus had been spread abroad. Everybody had heard about Jesus. That's why... That's why every place he went, there was a multitude of people waiting for him. Man, in a day that nobody could text anything, it wasn't on Facebook, it wasn't anybody. I mean, word got around, just word got around. Jesus is coming, boom, thousands are there. But imagine how hard it has to be for Jairus. Because first of all, in the Jews' religion, which he was in, that meant that he was really no friend of Jesus. I mean, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a prominent individual in the synagogue there. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that was the standard practice of Jesus. It became the standard practice of the Apostle Paul and others that when they came into a near area, they would immediately go to the synagogue and in the synagogue, they had, a, they had really kind of what I consider to be kind of a bizarre tradition. And that is, if anybody new came in the synagogue, they were given the opportunity to stand up and say something. I would be very afraid to do that here at Elmwood Baptist Church. In most churches, you would never do something like that because you have no idea what you might get. But word had gotten out. This Jesus of Nazareth, he's persona non grata in our, in our synagogues. I mean, in the Jews' religion, they become very, very hostile to Jesus. And here Jairus is coming, and he's humbled himself greatly, beloved, because he's seeking out the very enemy of the Jews' religion. 
What are all my friends going to think? Oh, we, we never let those kind of things bother us. We're way above that. We're way above that, right? Yeah, when, when, you were, when, when you were a teenager, it didn't matter what your friends thought. Oh, forget about being teenagers. We're adults now. And we have arrived, and it doesn't matter what our friends think. Yeah, right. Do you believe that? And here Jairus is, and, and you know he's saying to himself, man, I don't know what they're going to think. I mean, I'm well known. Jesus is even more well known. I'm coming to Jesus, and it's going to be on the front page of every paper in town. I'm probably going to lose my job. I'm going to probably lose my livelihood because I've now come out for Jesus. You know something, beloved? Uh, I think that still exists in 2023. I think there's a lot of closet Christians because they're afraid of what their friends, their co-workers, or their relatives are going to say if they really, really, really come out for Jesus. And yet, Jairus, he puts down his pride. This little girl's dying. There's no time to be worrying about what my neighbors are going to think, my relatives are going to think, or anybody's going to think. My little girl's dying. And he puts down his fear. I don't care. I don't care if I lose my job. I'll get another job. I don't care what anybody, hey, listen, my friends will stick with me, and the ones who were fake friends will leave me. But if I have my little girl, I got everything. Jairus doesn't know anything really about Jesus except for what he's heard. And what he heard was enough. And so when he left his home, his girl was very sick, nigh to death, and he left in a desperate search for Jesus. I hear he's coming. I hear he's over here. Word has circulated around. A multitude of people have met the boat. Jesus is over here. I'm going there. I'm going to get Jesus. Hold on. I'm bringing Jesus. <clears throat> let, me, let me just say, when tragedy comes, it doesn't care who you are. Tragedy could care less about your achievements in life. Tragedy does not care what your assets are. Tragedy doesn't care where you go to church. It doesn't care if you tithe. It doesn't care if you read your Bible. It doesn't care if you pray. It doesn't care. Tragedy is no respecter of anybody. So when the trials come, and they will, I don't mean to scare anybody, but listen, there are people sitting in this room right now that heard me say that the next heartbreaking moment is sitting right next to you. And you know what? There are some people in this room that could rise up and say, you know what, Pastor, you were absolutely right. Because the next tragic, heartbreaking absolutely earth-shattering event in my life was sitting right next to me. Well, you know what? Trials are going to come. We need something more than empty religion when trials come. You had better really have a grip on Jesus. You better have a real, personal, passionate, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ or you're in for a tumble. So what are you really trusting today? Where, where are you hanging your hat today? I want you to notice something else unusual about this man. In verse 23, I want you to see that his faith had action attached to it. 
He says, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Regardless of whatever Jairus has heard, until what he has heard goes beyond just hearing, he is not going to experience anything. If you are just, and I are just a hearer of the word, and not a doer of the word, it means absolutely nothing. You're reading the Bible like you read a magazine. You're reading the Bible like you read the newspaper. Nothing is getting in. Nothing is changing. Nothing is getting different. And until it goes beyond hearing to doing, nothing is going to be experienced. And somehow Jairus got it. Regardless of whatever he's heard. He's going beyond hearing now. And my friend, listen to me. Real faith always produces action. Real faith shows up in a person's life. If it doesn't, then all it is is lip service. That's it. And Jairus believes that if the Lord touches his little girl, that she will live. He's an amazing man. This faith, that this new found faith. Listen, if, if somewhere in all of this, Jairus has genuinely turned his heart to Christ and gotten saved, then understand he's been a Christian for a matter of minutes. There are Christians that have been saved for 40 years that don't have this faith. He's been maybe saved for minutes. And this is the faith the Lord is looking for. He's looking for it in Gary's life. He's looking for it in your life. He wants us to come to the end of ourselves. And when we come to the end of ourselves and we come to the understanding that we can't, then we clearly understand that He can. Jairus is a picture of times when our faith is just very weak and very small and we're discouraged and we're down. But understand, it's not about the size of faith. It's about faith. It's about trusting. It's about believing. Faith will always, true faith will always be honored by God. The Bible clearly says it's the only thing that pleases Him. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. In John 14, verse 13 and 14, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, anything in my name has already been identified as whatever it would be that would glorify the Father through the Son. So it's not just anything. Just ask me anything. Oh, yeah, I'd like to have uh, President Biden's Corvette. Well, guess what? You're not going to get it. Because that wouldn't glorify the Father through the Son. You know, however, if you maybe ask the Lord, well, Lord... I will faithfully witness to this person or whatever it might be. And Lord, I'm trusting you that that person will get saved. Now, now you're going to see an answer to prayer at some point because now the Father will be glorified through the Son. Faith in Jesus Christ, let's face it, (laughs) it's always small. I don't think any of us in this room could honestly stand up and say, I've got great 
faith. But do we have faith? I shared in a message not long ago that Jesus told the disciples that were terrified. He was sleeping in the bottom of the boat and a big storm comes up. They're terrified they're going to die and they, they tell him and, and he chides them and says, how is it that you have no faith? No faith. No faith. Not little faith. How is it that you can't hardly believe? How is it that your faith is teeny tiny? How is it that you just don't believe me? No, he says, how is it that you have no faith? Wow. So here, Jairus, his faith got revealed in a very, very tragic moment in time. But I want you to see number two, I want you to see his patient faith. Because this really convicts me, and I don't know about you, but it convicts me. Beginning in verse 24, several passages, just follow with me if you would. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. That also is faith revealed. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? And we ought to pause there for a moment and say, you know what, in the multitude, there was a lot of people touching Jesus, but there was only one that touched him by faith, and, and she got the result of faith. And he looked around about to see her that had touched, that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing uh, what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Wow. Does it do you not find it remarkable that Jesus didn't have the foggiest clue, I mean, initially who this woman was, but he knew she had a plague? And he knew what had happened? I mean, only God could know that. And Jesus, in his deity, knew this woman. But here, here Jairus is. <laughs> Jesus is talking to this woman, and here's Jairus. His little girl's dying. His little girl's dying. Here Jesus is thronged by this crowd. This sick woman gets healed. That's what Jairus wants for his little girl. And, and Jesus stops, and he comforts this woman, and he talks to this woman, and minutes are passing by, and Jairus is standing there, and he's saying, my little girl's, I left and she was near death when I left. If Jairus, if Jairus is like most, you would think he's very upset at this point. You're thinking patience is waning. I, 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 I'm not up here. I'm, I, I don't need to have you turn your collars around so that I can confess my sins. But I, I'm going to tell you that just in the medical realm and just probably within the last couple of years, there have been times, I, I, I won't speak for Betty because I know there's been times also for her, but there have been times where I have just felt so absolutely helpless and can't do anything for my wife and it seems like nobody else wants to do anything either. 
And though I've got to praise God for a lot of wonderful things that He did in my life, sometimes patience just isn't there. Sometimes patience just seems to take a vacation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you just want to reach out and touch someone. And you know you can't do that. You know, it's entirely possible. I want to put this in your mind. It's entirely possible that Jairus knew this woman. And let me tell you why. First of all, Jairus is well known in the community. But guess who else is well known in the community? This woman. And here's why. Jairus is well known for his great position in the synagogue. She's known in the community because she's had an issue of blood. I want you to have that logged in. An issue of blood for 12 years. All the doctors that she went to and spent all of her money on couldn't help her. She's now worse. And she is an unclean woman in that community. The very fact that she could sneak in with the crowd and not have somebody, get out of here! What are you doing in here? The very fact that that could happen and she could actually get behind Jesus and touch the hem of His garment proves that she went in very low and touched the... Ladies, where is the hem of your garment? She went in. She snuck in. She maybe crawled in. But Jairus, once this all happened, she's going, he might be thinking in his mind, I know this woman. She's unclean. We won't even let her in the synagogue. <laughs> we really don't know what's going on, but I'm thinking that could possibly have happened. But here Jairus is, and he's just waiting. Because what else can he do? But boy, what else can he do? Doesn't, or what else can we do? Doesn't really help us when our patience is growing thin. Waiting on the Lord is the biggest test your faith will ever have. And here's an important faith-building lesson. God doesn't run on our schedule. The delays of the Christian life are designed to increase our faith, not destroy our faith. And if you want to grow to be a Christian of maturity, then it's going to take patience and you need to go back to James chapter number 1 and read it again. When God doesn't go as fast as you might like, then trust Him anyway. Just rest it there. Thirdly, I want you to see where J. Iris' faith is tried. He had a tried faith. Beginning in verse 35, notice, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue these great five words, Be not afraid, only believe. You see, when someone that we love dies, we think the very first emotion that happens is just grief. And, and maybe that's how it is unpacked in our reality at the moment. But in that grief apparently exists fear. Because that's 
how Jesus identified it. So Jesus finished up with this woman, and here comes the bad news. Thy daughter is dead. Don't you love the compassion of that? I mean, nobody's walking up and saying, Jairus, man, I'm so sorry to tell you this, man. I mean, is there some place we could sit down? Could you folks could please move? Does anybody have a chair? No compassion. No, no caring. Thy daughter's dead. Why botherest thou the master any further? Don't you just love the doctors that do it that way? But you know, someone said one time, a faith that can't be tried is a faith that can't be trusted. And now faith is getting tried. And this is bad news. And it's just a cold hard fact, I understand that, but man, And what these guys are saying, they don't have the faith of Jairus. They're saying, listen, hey, your daughter died, and even Jesus can't fix this. And I wonder how many Christians are like that. We can't see what God's doing behind the scenes. We, we don't know what God's doing. I'm not up here, uh, you know, I'm not up here saying, uh, 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 you know, hocus pocus, abracadabra, and everything's going to be fine. But I'm not God. We don't know what God's doing. We don't know what God's doing behind the scenes. We need to remember that God has a plan. That God has a purpose <clears throat> in everything that He's doing. <clears throat> I can't, I, I couldn't, Brother Zetterman told me last night in the text, he said, Pastor, no sense calling me anymore. I've been calling. I've been talking with him. I've been praying with him. He said, no sense calling me anymore. I can't hear you. Which means he can't hear his wife. Which means he can't hear anybody that's coming into the room. The cancer has gotten to that part of his brain. It's just robbed his hearing. It's robbed his legs. He can't move his legs. It is just, he said, he said this dying one, one inch of, at a time is no good. But I thought to myself, and, and, and honestly, you're a pastor and you've been a pastor for a long time and I'm sitting there reading his text and my goodness, I don't know what to say to him. I don't know what to say to him. I don't even know what to say in my own situation. Except that God has a purpose. And I don't know what it is. And in my finite human mind, I, I can't figure out what the purpose is. I can't. I, I know that when the man who led me to Christ, Pastor Elledge, I know when he was diagnosed with cerebral ataxia, very rare, rare brain disease, and it slowly has been deteriorating his brain. And, and now he went from this robust, you know, strong individual to he's reduced to um, he's in a motorized wheelchair. And we were talking one day, I, I think it was Pastor Dion and I, and we were talking about that. And I, I kind of rehearsed and I said, you know, he led me to Christ. And then he spent two years intensely discipling me and, and teaching, and both he and his wife Cheryl and Mrs. Dion, uh, with Betty as well, teaching us how to, to live as a Christian, how to read the Bible and study the Bible and, and teach us how to talk to somebody and, and maybe have the joy of seeing them come to Christ and taught us that. And I remember sitting across the table of Pastor Dion and I remember saying to him these words, I said, and now he's teaching me how to die. 
Because even though he's going through all of that stuff, every single picture that I see of him, he's got a big smile on his face. He can't, his family, I guess, can understand a little bit of how he's, what he's saying. I can't understand it. Um, but he's dying. He's dying slowly. And he's got a smile on his face. God has a plan. And when you can't see the plan, doesn't mean the plan doesn't exist. And we can't understand the purpose behind it all. It doesn't mean that there isn't a purpose that God has in mind. And God is working out His plan. I remember when Amber was killed, Pastor Chris. And, and we all thought, wow, this 18-year-old girl, you know, she hadn't even started living yet. Planning on going to Bible college if the Marine Corps didn't get her first. We teased about that. And, and wow, it'd be very easy, I guess, for the Knutsons or anybody that's gone through this experience to say, well, what in the world is the purpose in this? What is the purpose in this? You know, Three people died, and one was a teenager, and one was an adult man, and one was a little baby. I mean, talk about the spectrum of, of life, and they all gone in an instant. What in the world? But in the service, didn't 15 people get saved? That's at least part of the purpose. That's at least part of the plan. 15 people are going to be in heaven. That before that happened, we're on their way to hell. <laughs> Unreal. So see, we don't know. And God maybe is continuing to unfold that plan. I'm not done with that plan yet. I'm not done with that purpose yet. Why is somebody suffering? Why is somebody going through what they're going through? I don't have the answers. But all I can say is, it seems like these empty words... God has a plan. But it rings hollow, doesn't it? Let's be honest, it rings hollow, doesn't it? Somehow it doesn't bring a great deal of comfort. It's not like we don't know to say that stuff ourselves. But even because we know to say it, It doesn't necessarily give us any answers. The only thing that helps that is faith. God, listen, what do I know of God? He loves me. He loves me. What do I know of God? He's not trying to destroy me. He's not trying to hurt me. He's not trying to cast me down. He's not trying to bring me to destruction somehow. But what he is trying to do is he's trying to bring me to the end of myself. So that by faith, I can see him who can do everything. And I can do nothing. J. Iris, I, I wish I had his faith. I, Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But that's awful hard to do, isn't it? Lastly, I want you to see that J. Iris had a, a really fearless faith. In verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. So he hears this bad news. And Jesus looks at him. He's not looking at the bad news bearers. He's looking directly at Jairus. Or Jairus. 
And I think this is, I, I'm not being irreverent to the scriptures, but maybe this, is a, maybe this is a piece of dialogue that took place and we, we don't know. And I'm not trying to inject things into the Bible. But can't you hear Jesus saying, Jairus, don't believe what you hear. You believed me when you came to me. Do not, do not let fear keep you from believing now. Boy, doesn't that happen. Isn't it true that you and I arrive at certain situations in our life and we almost immediately draw conclusions? Isn't that true? Hey, can we be honest with ourselves for a moment? We come up against a tragedy possibly. And we instantly go to, well, nobody can help this. Well, it's all done. Well, it's all, it's finished. We don't know what God's doing. So they arrive at the house and everybody's wailing and crying. And why not? A little girl. They think a little girl's dying. And, and this is one of the marvelous mysteries in the Bible. I don't know that we're going to get any answers for this. There's medical people in this room. Don't, don't think I'm trying to create some kind of new medical miracle. I'm not. But I think that this honestly exists. Because Mark 39, you look at this. This is an interesting statement that Jesus makes. Look at it. Why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. So he tells these people, listen, would you just stop your crying? What are you crying for? This little girl's not dead. She's only sleeping. And, and, and what is revealed in Scripture, whether it's Lazarus in the tomb, or whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, the, the young man who's being carried out in the funeral uh, buyer out of town and Jesus stops them, or, or whether it's Jairus and his little girl, what, what, what seems to be taught here is something that medical science cannot ever, 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 ever create a machine to be able to detect. And that is, when the body lies down in death, the soul never dies. So that person, whether lost or saved, by the way, this is true, because the soul of the lost person never dies. Goes to a place called eternal death, but never dies. The body lies down. The machine goes straight line. And the greatest minds in medicine say, well, person died. Let's call it. But Jesus said, that little girl's soul is still alive. There's no machine that we can't put the little things on and say, yep, there's the heart and there's the soul. You see, that's too deep for us human beings. And will forever be too deep. Haven't you wondered, well, did the little girl go to heaven and now the Lord brings her back and she has to leave heaven and come back to this depressing place? Huh? How about Lazarus? He'd been dead for days. Did he go to heaven? And then the Lord brought him back and, 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 and he has to come back down here and for the rest of his existence, he's talking to Jesus saying, why don't you bring me back to this mess? I had it so good. Do you know what it's like to be standing there in, in great spot? Well, Jesus did know, but uh, here I am, and, and then all of a sudden, poof, I'm back here. No, dear friend, the soul never dies. The soul is eternal. Every soul in a human being is eternal. Somewhere a billion years from now, if a billion years could ever be 
uh, calculated, your soul will be alive somewhere, heaven or hell. Jesus is just letting Jairus and everyone else know that he's in control. And what a lesson. Because there's not a situation that we can think of that is beyond the ability of the Lord being able to handle it. In the end, the faith of Jairus won. Because of his faith, rooted in the Lord Jesus, he won. Now let me ask you this. If Jesus can do this, is there anything impossible for the Lord to do? Uh, the lost spouse or that really tough lost family member, they can be saved, can't they? They can be saved if we had any faith. That impossible problem can be handled if we had some faith. What is your need? What is your need this morning? What, 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 is, what is pressing on you? Maybe you're here and you say, you know what the truth of the matter is? I have some doubts about my salvation. Well, maybe you need to get assurance of your salvation. Or maybe you need to truly get saved. But I don't know your heart's condition. All I know is that you know if there's a need present. And so what is your need? Whatever it is, assurance, real true salvation, whatever, come to Jesus. During the invitation, come to Jesus. Put down your fear. Put down your pride. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about what people will say or think or, or whatever. Don't Be a Jairus. And come to Jesus. And coming to church membership doesn't do it. And listen, I love having people join the church. I hope people join the church today. I hope people get baptized today. I always hope that. I hope people get saved today. But it's coming to Jesus. It has to come to Jesus first. So what is the need? What's the need? Maybe you're saved here today. Pastor, I know I'm saved. But, but the truth of the matter is that your heart has gotten away from the Lord and it's become cold and, and you need to have your relationship warmed and, and you need to come, come to the Lord, to the place. Lord, I, I need to be close to you again. I need to, I need to have that closeness. Please, please warm my heart again. It's okay, to, it's okay to acknowledge that. That happens. I don't know a Christian that that hasn't happened to. Don't be so prideful that you have to cover yourself up because you're afraid of what somebody else might think. Come to Jesus.